Welcome to Praxis. I'm Olivia Rousset. I'd like to welcome our audience here in Sydney, as well as those watching on APAC, online, or listening on radio across the Asia Pacific. Today, our panel will be discussing development in the Pacific. We have Rob Jauncey, Senior Country Officer with the World Bank in Sydney, Daniel Rowland, who's the Law and Development Advisor at the University of Sydney Law School, and Caleb Jarvis from Pacific Trade and Invest. There are nine million people <coughs> scattered across the Pacific region, which spans one third of the globe's surface, but accounts for less than 2% of its land. In development terms, it's one of the most diverse regions in the world. The development challenges facing a country like Papua New Guinea, for instance, with around 6.7 million people and extensive natural resources, differs greatly from those of Tuvalu, which has a population of just 12,000 and limited resources. However, there is a common set of challenges. Geographical isolation, underemployment, shortage of infrastructure and high vulnerability to climate change, to name only a few. All of these present considerable constraints for development. But with improvement in a few key areas, many Pacific Island states could see improved growth and quality of life for their populations. Daniel, can you tell us the role that law and justice plays in development in the Pacific? Well, at a formal level, I, um, I would think that uh, law and justice plays a very significant role in the area of governance. One of the problems um, that people uh, point to in relation to the Pacific um, are uh, issues of governance um, throughout the Pacific. There are a number of uh, examples that have uh, occurred over the last 10 years or so. Uh, in Fiji, we've had coups. In the Solomon Islands, we've had uh, conflict, some might say a civil war. Uh, in Bougainville, part of PNG at the moment, um, there's been a civil war in the past. So there are issues of rather large uh, disturbances uh, which impact on, obviously, on government and governance. And at the end of the day, they have an impact uh, in terms of service delivery by government on its population, in terms of justice. We'll come to you for more detail in a, in a while. But Caleb, what do you see as the most important area to support for development in the Pacific? Thanks, Olivia. Um, I've worked uh, for the private sector and the public sector in the Pacific for over 10 years, and it's my view and um, others that um, a dynamic private sector coupled with responsible investment is absolutely fundamental to achieving economic growth and prosperity in the region. Um, the private sector can play a key role, and those that I talk to from bureaucrats to policy makers to academics to um, the, the men and women on the ground, the business people, um, that, you know, they're, they're keen to play an active role as well. And, you know, I'd like to also say that, um, yet in, in reality, um, I think there's very little support for entrepreneurs and business people on the ground, and, and that's something that uh, needs to change in the future if we want to see um, development improve in the Pacific. Despite the constraints in the Pacific, as, as I've listed, um, you're optimistic. Yeah, look, I, I am optimistic about the Pacific, um, possibly because I'm a glass half full sort of guy. Um, I think the challenges you've outlined are very real. The Pacific Islands are, are uniquely small and remote. We, we have 10 million people, as you say, scattered over you know, a quarter, a third of, of the world's area. Even within countries, distances are staggering. I mean, Kiribati has 100,000 people, over 20 atolls in, in four time zones. Um, and because of this tyranny of distance, the economies are inherently volatile and vulnerable. Their small size means they're narrowly based, they're heavily dependent on imports, um, highly exposed to price shocks, as we saw with the food and fuel price spikes and with food prices again increasing, and, and very vulnerable to climate change and other natural disasters. But they also have a lot going for them. Um, the Pacific Islands have some of the most beautiful natural scenery in the world. They have very significant natural resources in their fish, in their timber, in their minerals. They've got a vibrant traditional culture, and I think the, the people of the Pacific are, are the greatest strength of, of the region. And while we'd all like to see faster improvements, the simple fact is that since independence in the 70s and 80s, we've seen real gains um, in social indicators in, in the Pacific. In that period, 
Life expectancy in most countries has increased by about 10 years. And infant mortality has, has fallen by 30, 40, in some cases even 50%. Um, but if the countries are going to make the most of these assets, I think we're going to need to see domestic leadership. Uh, we're going to need to see support from partners. Um, and we're going to see, need to see a, a much greater effort to address common regional problems in, in a regional way. Where have you seen the most um, change? In the Pacific. Yeah. Look, I think domestic leadership um, and good economic management are, are vital for any countries, and it's true in, in the Pacific um, just as for, for, for larger countries, despite their volatility. Um, I think two areas where we've seen real progress are, are Vanuatu and Samoa. Um, Vanuatu, despite having fewer natural resources um, than many of its Melanesian neighbours, has grown very strongly in the past decade. And that's been because of policies that have promoted stability, promoted investment, um, promoted tourism. Um, similarly, Samoa, um, in the past 15 years since the early 90s, have grown much faster um, than the other countries in, in the region. Um, we've seen sustained growth, and we've seen that harnessed in a way that has flowed through uh, to improve living standards, education, health services for, for the people. So I think they're examples that, that reform can work. Can you talk a little bit about <coughs> telecoms and how yeah. that's grown? The telecoms revolution in the Pacific over the past five years for me has been you know, one of the, the, the greatest development success stories in the region. We've seen countries open up their markets, encourage new private investment, um, encourage competition and as a result we've seen mobile phone coverage rates increase from sort of 6% of the population to 60% of, of the population in the space of just three, four years. Mm -hmm. Now these weren't always easy decisions to make but I think this shows that, that reform can pay off. Mm -hmm. And how was that done? How, what, were, what were the reforms that were needed or the support that was needed yeah. to... I think the, the key for this is, is encouraging new private investment. In many areas of the Pacific we've had very government dominated economies and this showed the benefit of opening up markets to competition, encouraging new investment, um, looking at new ways of doing things and I think there are real opportunities to do similar things in the energy sector and a whole wide range of sectors in the Pacific. Do you think, with, with all these reforms um, and, and all these different sort of changes, do you think that Pacific countries will be able to be self-sustaining one day? Look, I think reform is a necessary but not always sufficient um, condition uh, for, for development in, in the region. Um, the systemic vulnerability, the systemic volatility um, of many of the smaller Pacific islands means some are going to struggle even at the best of times, uh, to provide the kind of services that, that modern-day Pacific citizens have, have come to expect. Um, and if aspirations are to be met, the international community is going to need to, to, to do its part too. Um, aid is likely to be a, a permanent rather than a temporary phenomena in some of these countries, in exactly the same way as in Australia we subsidise services to the outback or the US subsidises services to Hawaii or France to, to, to New Caledonia. And uh, finally, before we move on to Caleb, how, how important is um, regional integration and, and also with New Zealand and Australia as well? Yeah. I think Pacific leaders have, have highlighted um, themselves the importance of regional integration. We've heard it in the Cairns Compact, we've heard it in the Pacific Plan. But this is an area where I think there's much more room to accelerate progress. And I think there are probably three areas I'd highlight. Um, the first is the opportunity for the countries to work themselves um, on regional service delivery and to gain efficiencies of scale from a common approach. And we're starting to see it in telecoms regulation, in audit standards, in a few areas. But I think that's something uh, where more progress could be made. I think the second area, regional countries can do more to manage their, their common regional uh, resources in a collective way. And I think we've started to see, uh, just in the past few years, the regional countries themselves make some movement on the fisheries resource. The Pacific has about 20% of the world's tuna resources, 
and we've seen in terms of reducing the, ep the catch effort, in terms of better vessel monitoring, in terms of closing high seas pockets, um, some real changes there. But I think it's an area more can be done. And I think the final area, we need to look at opportunities for the region to integrate not just with themselves, but with their nearest large markets, with Australia, with New Zealand, with the fast growing countries of East Asia. And I think a very important area there is going to be increasing opportunities for labour migration. New Zealand's done some wonderful things with the temporary uh, labour migration scheme that has been a real win-win. Um, it's, it's increased remittances to the Pacific by 30, 40 million, but it's allowed New Zealand growers uh, to increase output by 150 million. And I think the more we can see that, uh, both in terms of changing the skill mix and providing opportunities for more skilled labourers, nurses coming, for instance, to, to regional areas in Australia <coughs> where we have a shortage, the more we can look perhaps at implementing a regional labour market uh, through free trade agreements in the region, I think that, that offers particular scope for, for the region. As I said, the people of the region are their greatest assets and this is a way of, of being able to give them opportunities in a way that works for both the Pacific and for countries like Australia. Thanks. And Caleb, you're, you're very much on the same page as, as Rob as far as private investment. Can you give an example of a, a, a case of successful support of a private yeah, look, I think there's a lot of commonalities, um, uh, you know, what I'd like to say and, and reinforce that Rob's just said as well. Um, and, you know, I want to tell you a story about um, a visit um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. But uh, before I do, I just wanted to highlight, you know, again, some of, you know, we have to be realistic that uh, there are challenges, uh, you know, throughout the region. And the isolation is a big challenge, particularly when you look at, you um, you know, how that isolation impacts the exports of products and, the, you know, that, that distance, um, you, you know, increases shipping costs and that increases the cost of goods sold and, you know, in terms of being competitive on a global stage, that, that, that's a real issue. In the region, uh, there is a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of red tape and I think to attract foreign direct investment, you know, these are things that need to change and improve. And, and there, is, um, there is progress on that front as, as well, and I know the World Bank um, is focusing on that particular issue. Um, there is a real lack of access to capital within the region. Uh, there's, you know, the microfinance solutions that, that are operating in the Pacific um, uh, are not always appropriate for the Pacific in, in their models and the way that they... Um, you know, able to, um, you know, provide capital to growing businesses. And private banks, traditionally, they're, they're going to want to pick winners. Um, that's how they operate their business and they're very successful and provide a great service to certain businesses. But uh, a great challenge is, is that um, there's that gap in the middle and they're not able, businesses and business people are not able to access capital to grow their business and, and increase employment opportunities. And, and again, I think that's that's a role that um, donor agencies need to, to really carefully consider as well. When we look at the positives in terms of uh, what the region has to offer, um, you know, they're, they're, I'm, I'm very optimistic. You know, I think there is great potential in the Pacific to grow and expand and attract foreign investment. If you look at their, their resources, there's great resources in agriculture. You know, there's very fertile land, there's plentiful water, there's abundant fisheries. Uh, when you look at the agriculture exports at the moment, there's, there's you know, good growth in coffee, in timber, coconut products and their byproducts. Cocoa is particularly um, important at the moment as well. Demand increases at 40% per annum and uh, many countries, um, you know, are having problems with, with blight. But as I said, um, I just want to talk about, um, you know, this, a, a recent story. We took a a buyer of essential oils up into PNG to uh, East New Britain province, which is an island just north of the mainland of PNG. Um, the businesses that, um, you know, the exporters that we were taking the buyer to meet um, live in isolation, live very modestly, um, but not only do they run a, a, a successful business, they also are very focused on community development, and these people. Uh, as they go up into these remote regions, take medical supplies, they take educational supplies because 
the national and provincial governments and donor agencies um, are not able to deliver those type of services there. The buyer himself was so absolutely overwhelmed in terms of what he saw and their impact on the community that he has unequivocally committed to buying all the product that they can produce as long as they meet a basic um, quality control. You know, it happens to be 31% alcohol in the essential oils. And at the moment, that business provides livelihood to hundreds of villages and, and their families at the moment. What this business doesn't have is, is ongoing consistent support. And they've been able to receive some support, but at the moment, um, you know, they need $9,000 uh, to uh, build a basic laboratory so that they can guarantee the, the quality of the essential oils. Um, now that they have uh, an open purchase order as such, uh, we are working very hard to get them the $9,000. And despite billions of dollars in aids flowing throughout the region <coughs> each year, it is very difficult to find that level of support. Um, we will find them that money and as a result, uh, rather than just employing, providing livelihood to hundreds of villages, they will be able to provide a livelihood to thousands of villages. And this will happen, you know, we're absolutely assured that it's just a matter of time and a matter of months, you know, we're not talking years. That's a pretty small scale investment to have that impact compared to larger businesses that might employ fewer people but take a lot more resources. Isn't it? Well, I think that's right. And if you make a direct comparison to the investment that's happening in the LNG pipeline in Papua New Guinea at the moment, which is a significant investment, it's great, great um, investment in the country, but will have challenges on the way through, particularly social challenges. But in some ways, um, this small investment and these entrepreneurs, um, and we're only talking two business people, will provide more employment to Papua New Guineans on the ground than the LNG project will provide in the long term. Um, so again, you know, my argument is, is that donor agencies in particular and national governments need to relook at their strategies in terms of supporting entrepreneurs, and I use the term entrepreneurs versus the private sector, uh, in, in private sector development because those people just aren't getting the support and encouragement and cap access to capital that they need to make profound impact uh, in terms of alleviating poverty in the Pacific. Okay, I'll just move on to Daniel. Um, obviously none of this can happen, no investment um, isn't going to happen without some sort of law and order, law and justice uh, system in place. Can you give it the Pacific's huge in so many ways and diverse in so many ways. Can you just sort of give a snapshot of a variety or a range of situations when it comes to law and justice in the Pacific? Certainly. Um, generally, what, what's happened with law and justice over the last 30 years or so since, uh, since independence is that the sector, as we understand it at a state or formal level, has been allowed to, to run down in terms of budget allocations, human resources, intellectual resources, financial resources. And um, if you link law and justice to economic growth, um, and if you don't uh, promote expenditure in law and justice and on the institutions that promote law and justice, uh, there could be problems further down the track when disputes and conflicts arise. Now, in the Pacific, um, specifically I've mentioned already issues of governance uh, that have arisen which are sort of macro issues of law and justice, issues like uh, the conflict in Bougainville, uh, the tensions in the Solomon Islands, uh, the coups, if you like, in Fiji, some disruptions in both Vanuatu and, and Tonga. Um, these, these reflect different situations, individual situations caused um, by, again, different different causes behind each of them. So um, nonetheless, it, it's, it's, it's understood now by the international community, and it has been probably for about 10 years, that law and justice, it, 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 law and justice institutions play a significant role in improving governance. And there's been an exponential growth by the donor community at uh, a regional level, at a bilateral level, at a multilateral level in work in, in law, and, law and justice. So, for example, AusAid, uh, as a donor in 
and, and the major donor playing a role in the Pacific, spends approximately um, 60 to $70 million a year in, uh, in, what, what are called, in what's called law and justice development um, around the Pacific, including PNG. PNG is probably, uh, along with the Solomon Islands, two of the largest areas where donors are working. Um, um, I think AusAid is spending about $25 million a year in each of those jurisdictions. And um, most of the work, most of the aid, uh, most of the assistance is going into what, what's called the formal uh, legal sector. It's about improving uh, the processes of, of law, the processes of justice. They're, uh, they're working with police, they're working with prosecutors, with defenders, with courts, what's, and with corrections and diversions uh, to corrections. Um, they're, um, uh, these are elements of institutional strengthening and capacity building, which, which is now s s understood by donors to, to be a response to deficiencies in law and justice over the previous 20 years. There's, There's really different reasons in Papua New Guinea and the Solomons. They're quite different cases, aren't quite they? Quite different cases. The, the Solomon Islands mm -hmm. is a case of, if you like, a post-conflict situation. There was a... There was a, a, a ethnic tensions be largely between two major islands and uh, Malaita and Guadalcanal, which was allowed, for whatever reason, to descend into uh, conflict in the late 90s through to 2003, when a regional mission was put together by uh, the Pacific region as a whole, led by Australia and, and, and New Zealand. And one of the three pillars for the regional assistance in the Solomon Islands, um, uh, by Ramsey, the Regional Assistance Mission to the Solomon Islands, was and still is law and justice. Uh, the initial focus in the first few years has been on law and order, um, dealing with the troubles arising out of, from the, uh, of the uh, criminal activities that occurred during the, those uh, four or five years until 2003. Um, there will come a time, and in a sense, an extraordinary amount of expenditure by donors, such as AusAid in particular, um, in this regional mission, which, which by any account uh, would seem to be unsustainable in the long term. I think there was a commitment to about a billion dollars uh, for five years generally to, to the Ramsey mission. Um, so one of, the, one of the challenges moving forward for a, a country like the Solomon Islands in a post-conflict situation is moving from uh, a law and order environment where stability is being uh, returned uh, at, at the country level to a, more of a law and justice context where the institutions can return to playing a role in not conflict resolution but dispute <coughs> resolution as and where the state has a presence. And of course, that raises yet another issue, and that is that in a country like the Solomon Islands and in other countries around the Pacific in different ways at different levels, the state isn't always present uh, throughout the country. In fact, uh, in terms of law and justice uh, penetration, it's really uh, largely ap apparent in urban centres what occurs in 80% of of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the countries where the rural communities are this is um, that informal systems of justice um, apply and I think one of the challenges over the next 50 years is that balance between the state systems of law and justice and the informal systems of law and justice that prevail in, in most communities. Do you think in, in the way donor communities work in the very top down approach traditionally, do you think there is enough attention being paid to more bottom-up or even more traditional customs and ways of dealing with I, I think the first reaction of donors is naturally to work through government and that it inevitably brings you into working with uh, the institutions of government and administration which brings you into the courts, the police and, and the formal sector at large. But mm. Uh, increasingly over the last few years, probably the last five years in, in the case of um, 
this region, there's been an awareness amongst uh, donors that there's a need to uh, also look at uh, what are called bottom-up approaches to um, law and justice, to empowering local communities through uh, providing uh, 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 legal awareness, um, through providing uh, processes for community engagement in law and justice at the local level, um, through village courts uh, in PNG or local courts in the Solomon Islands, which are a very interesting hybrid of, of customary law and, and, uh, and formal law. So increasingly there is a, a view that um, there's a need to look at, if you like, um, the demand side of law and justice at the local level uh, through uh, empowerment processes. And I think the AusAids of this world are increasingly uh, including strategies for um, access to justice or legal empowerment or bottom-up approaches. Just finally, it, it, it's a big question, but the Solomons it, it needs to have some kind of transition at some point. Just like I said to Rob, with um, sort of economically with different issues, do you think they'll be so, they'll be able to be self-sustaining eventually, or do you think there will always be this element of? Well, I can only speak in the in, the, in sort of the law and justice area, as far as I know. Um, but the same, the same. But I, sort I, of I, idea I would I, I would I would say that um, um, in my experience, uh, it's it's not uh, it's not round the corner. This is n not an area of where. Uh, where um, of, of self-sustainability, mm. and I think that's a very interesting uh, conundrum because, uh, of course, the Ausaids of this world are working to alleviate poverty and uh, to achieve or to help countries alleviate poverty and uh, and to achieve sustainable development. Um, I don't think that's necessarily an area which uh, people should worry about. A little bit like Rob, I think the world of of aid and, de and development. Uh, the, the role of the donor is here to stay for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Caleb, did you? Yeah, I just wanted to add that when we talk about sustainability in the Pacific Islands, I think we need to put that in context that, you know, some of these um, societies have, have been in existence for some 49,000 years and that, you know, they the, the people, um, you know, are the most important assets in their cultures and their traditional knowledge as well and that, in a lot of ways, they've been far more successful in terms of sustainability than, um, you know, uh, Western their Western allies and and other Western philosophies as well. And I have no doubt that they will continue to be sustainable in the long run. And it's just a question of, you know, where do they need support, um, you know, support to grow. And I think it's really critical that w we do that in a responsible fashion that will will also uh, ensure that we protect their family systems and the culture and their traditional knowledge, which um, is becoming such a rare and valuable commodity um, in our society. I'd like to emphasise that notion of cultural context. I think it's terribly important in terms of certainly outsiders coming in to assist. Um, and it's, uh, it's probably something that donors need to pay further attention to. Um, and I think uh, uh, work in the Pacific always helps with the in input of anthropologists, and I know that uh, uh, that's something that's increasingly done uh, in places like PNG mm. by some of the donors in the law and justice area, mm. where there is that interplay between formal state-driven law uh, systems and informal traditional customary law systems. Mm. But um, you asked me about the Solomon Islands. There are many uh, examples in the Pacific where I think uh, moving forward, first of all, where donors don't provide any law and justice assistance, mm. and where if they do, um, like in a minimal sort of way to a country like Samoa, uh, one can see looking forward that in the near future these are areas of total self-sustainable mm. uh, processes. So, it, I mean, the thing about the Pacific is, is horses for courses. There are yeah, yeah. different examples and different cases, and um, uh, I wouldn't want to leave the impression by concentrating on a conflict, post-conflict yeah. situation, that the Pacific <coughs> as a whole, we're dealing with very difficult situations of what some might call basket cases. There was a phrase used um, in, in, in the, 
the previous few years of uh, an arc of instability. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's been overplayed in, in mm. some ways, certainly when it comes to uh, law and justice. Mm. Okay, I'd like to open up to the audience for questions at this point. Does anyone have a question for any of the panellists? Um, my question is directed at Caleb. Uh, you talked a lot about stimulating private sector investment and supporting entrepreneurship within the Pacific and I know that there's programs that um, donors like Ausaid run, like the Enterprise Challenge Fund, things like that, but I'd be interested to hear from you what you see uh, could be strategies that donors could be increasingly engaging in in order to support um, this obviously important area of private sector investment. You referred to the uh, Enterprise Challenge Fund and in fact uh, I've always been uh, a big supporter of the fund in, in terms of its concept. Uh, I think in reality it became um, you know, difficult to administer that fund and in fact that fund uh, you know, is highly, a highly risky strategy for, for Ausaid to, to implement and uh, at the moment it's in a monitoring and evaluation framework stage. Uh, we'd like to see uh, further funds committed to the ongoing development of the private sector. And look, you know, I, I, I really sense and, and feel um, through my conversations with people in the Pacific Islands that it is the, the business people, in essence, on the ground who, who take the risk and um, often live in isolated communities and provide livelihood. You know, the thing about providing someone with a job and some income is that then they can seek out better opportunities for their family in terms of health and education and basic living standards. If we look at Australia, for example, off the top of my head, I could list off at least a dozen programs that the Australian government supports in terms of providing support and funding to individual businesses, um, you know, men and women as well, and that that would range in the billions of dollars a type of support. My argument is that we don't actually need to invent this stuff, it exists. What we need to be able to do is uh, refine that um, and look at funding some of those enterprise type programs into, into the Pacific Islands. As, a, as I sort of indicated before, access to capital is a huge problem. Um, less than 20% of the Pacific Island population has access to financial services and almost every business we talk to um, has a problem with raising capital to grow their business. And that's something that, that we need to continue to look at. Um, and, you know, again, looking at Australia, there's uh, great um, precedent in terms of Enterprise Connect, there's Trade Start, there's Oz Industry, and, um, you know, and the, and the list goes on. But again, uh, my view, and, and, and I think it's a widely accepted view, is that the private sector, NGOs, civil societies have a much greater role to play. Um, but in fact, in some stage, I think the Australian government lead, needs to work on exit strategies for providing funds into the Pacific. Uh, I'd like to see that you know, donor agencies focus on the traditional sectors such as health and education and infrastructure, which is so vital, and also providing a, a significantly higher percentage of their funds towards supporting businessmen and people. And, you know, that's not to subtract uh, and detract from uh, what is currently happening in reform and governance, but when, when we look specifically at Ausaid, their budget will double. Uh, by the year 2015 to uh, $8 billion. And with the recent reviews that have been going on, um, you know, there's been a decision to reduce the number of technical advisors within the region. And that's going to provide, you know, of the $4 billion that's out there, I keep thinking, well, if they're not paying technical advisors, what are their strategies to provide um, support in the region with their $4 billion? But as it goes to $8 billion, I say, well, what is going to change? And you know, if we keep doing the same things, we'll keep getting the same results. If you look at the way the Pacific Islands has been performing against the Millennium Development Goals, um, they've performed quite poorly. In some countries, such as Papua New Guinea, they've actually deteriorated and going backwards. And infant mortality, death rates, uh, uh, you know, those sort of statistics, you know, it's just not acceptable in this day and age that. Um, you know, those, those tragedies continue to occur. And I spent seven years living in Port Moresby. I have seen babies die. I ran a pharmacy in the hospital, and it's something that, you know, I'm very passionate about and, and that I would like to see real change happen. 
Can I add a comment there, or in fact, add two comments? One, I think, um, you know, on the MDG side, things aren't moving always as fast as we would like, but I, I, I think it is important to see the glass as half full rather than half empty. In PNG since independence, life expectancy has improved by, by, by 10 years and infant mortality has halved. I, I, I think we, we do need to see the, the progress as well as the, the challenges. Um, and the second comment I want to make, I think there are absolutely, as Caleb said, things government and donors can, can do to encourage the private sector. One of the things the governments can do is get out of the way. Um, if we look at the, the amount of red tape um, in most countries in the Pacific, even for local entrepreneurs wanting to start a business, to register a business, you know, it's, it's pretty high. And those countries like Vanuatu and Samoa that, that have minimised the, the red tape have actually managed to, to encourage a, a more flourishing domestic uh, private sector. And I think the same thing even goes for, for big investments. You know, if governments get out of the way, if, if they get rid of these sort of state-owned telecoms monopolies, state-owned energy monopolies, and allow competition and open these sectors up for, for investment, we've seen some of the gains that, that, that can be made. Uh, and one of the roles of law and justice is, uh, is uh, <coughs> as, to act as an enabler to facilitate um, economic growth um, at, at the at the regulatory level. Um, I think I'm right in saying that in the World Bank Doing Business report, um, because of some reforms that the Tonga justice and, uh, system did in terms of court procedures and processes um, a few years ago, uh, Tonga made um, a significant improvement in uh, the enforcement of contracts, which is one of the bases, if you like, of, of, of a, uh, a workable economic system. Um, and uh, improved quite significantly the processes for enforcing contract. That, in a small way, is part of a puzzle which can enable, facilitate trade and development. Another question? On the infrastructure strategies and approaches in the Pacific Islands, what, what has been the agenda and, um, uh, from the bank's point of view in terms of water, roads, energy areas like that? to help, of course, support sustainability yeah. in the longer term. Yeah. Look, thanks, John. I, I think in infrastructure is critical and it's a critical backbone for growth and trade everywhere. Um, and the bank has been working particularly in the transport sector in the Pacific, but increasingly in energy and telecoms and, and others. I think one of the themes that has run through our approach in all of these sectors is let's see if we can open infrastructure up to new ways of doing business. So I think, for instance, the, the airlines sector in the Pacific was very state-dominated 10, 15 years ago. We, we had state companies providing poor services, bleeding red ink um, onto government budgets. And I think the rationalisation of the airline industry and new, new private investment there has, has been transformative. I think the same thing has happened with, with telecoms, uh, where we've got new private investment in competition, and it's, it's just, it's been a revolution. Um, even on the transport side of things, which I think is going to be a much more traditionally government-provided service in, in the Pacific, I think there are still ways to, to build local private sector capacity to do maintenance and deliver services, and one of the real successes has been Samoa where by building this local capacity, they were able to respond very quickly and very effectively themselves to, to the tsunami. So I think the, the bottom line from my perspective, infrastructure is critical, but let's see how we can also bring in private sector investment uh, to provide some of these services as well. In the case of Samoa, what were the, the specifics of the uh, in, transport infrastructure support that the Look, we've been working in Samoa for, for about 12, 13 years. Uh, it's been mostly on the road sector, but it's been very much focused on building local private sector capacity to undertake maintenance. And we started at very simple level, routine maintenance, 
and moved up now to there's local capacity to, to be able to do you know some some pretty complex and serious construction without having to bring in you know international firms uh, to do this and I think that's been one one of the successes of it can I just give a local example of, uh, of in the importance of infrastructure um, in some situations um, there's uh, there's a policy from the Solomon Islands government uh, called Justice Delivered Locally. One of the hindrances to the delivery of formal justice locally beyond the uh, urban capital is, is, uh, is the lack of housing for magistrates and justice officials. So without those, magistrates, judges, won't, police won't, won't be present. So uh, there's an element of infrastructure that is important in the in the delivery of justice at a very local level in countries like the Solomon Islands. Mm -hmm. That's a, uh, just a small example. There's a question just up the back. Hi, uh, Nick Goodwin from the University of Sydney. Um, I've, we've heard a lot today about the private sector and about uh, government getting out of the way. I was wondering uh, what your views on some of the new donors in the Pacific um, who have a very private sector, uh, well, what can be seen as a very private sector centred approach in terms of, especially with China, um, is that the sort of private sector approach, which which is, is certainly not? Um, they're, they're sort of bypassing some of the, the donor mechanisms and some of the other sort of approaches that we've we've uh, we hold dear. So I was just wondering if how that's challenging this sort of idea of the role of the private sector. Rob, would you like to? Take Let me make a first cut at it, and others might as well. Look. My sense is the bottom line in this is that new donors in the region are a good thing. Um, you know, it's great to, to have China, Japan, Korea um, providing more uh, resources for, for the region than, than we would have got without them. Now, having said that, I think, you know, we all do need to make an effort, both the traditional donors and the new donors, to see if we can coordinate a little bit better uh, to make sure that we're not stepping on each other's toes, um, to make sure that resources are coming in as much as possible on grant rather than loan terms, um, and to make sure we're, we're building up local capacity um, as well as just um, undertaking construction you know, with, with, with labour imported from, from China or, or, or elsewhere. So I think it's a good thing, um, but I think both traditional and non-traditional donors need to, to work a bit more closely together to make sure it's an even better thing um, for the region. Would either of you like to add to that? Yeah, I'd okay. like to make uh, some comments that uh, I, I think, uh, like anything, competition's a good thing. Um, and with China, uh, increasingly interested in the Pacific and again um, you ask the questions why well I think the Pacific does have some great natural resources I think the the challenge will be to ensure that uh, investment from wherever it comes is sustainable and responsible um, and that's that's again you know that's going to be the challenge for, for national governments and look if we, we look at Fiji situation at the moment um, you know with the with the Australian government's current standing that, um, you know, um, Banamarama is, is uh, publicly looking north to India and China. Um, and, you know, that investment and that donor support sort of leads on to other much more critical issues such as security within the region. You know, is it just a matter of time until Chinese nuclear vessels will be, be anchored um, in, in the Fijian Islands and cruising the Pacific? Um, and I think the Australian government needs to continue to challenge its, um, its thinking, particularly on Fiji and the region. Um, but again, uh, like Rob said, it, it, you, you know, we have to ensure that um, you know, what, what happens is sustainable and that it takes into consideration the, the, the impact on the, the locals, the situation, um, you know, the, the investment that's happened in the nickel mines in, um, in Medang at the moment with uh, Ramu Nickel. Uh, they've had a lot of problems because they seem to have been able to circumvent some of the, 
uh, immigration and labour laws at the moment and bringing in Chinese workers to work for the same money um, that uh, you know Papua New Guineans could work for and and then in that situation the the locals uh, local Papua New Guineans actually uh, were able to shut down the mine um, and you know that's not good for anybody and it is a massive project and and uh, you, you know I think any investment needs to consider how they can um, you know improve the local labour force, um, improve leadership issues as well. And if that's the form it comes in, then I think it's a great thing. From the law and justice uh, perspective, and that is that Australia and New Zealand um, in the region have a comparative advantage over the Chinas, the Japans, the Malay well, not so much the Malaysia, but, uh, but the European Union. And that is that the 14 countries that make up um, the Pacific Island Forum are common law countries and uh, they share a, a tradition that, uh, that we also have and uh, that's not a tradition in a legal sense in, in any of the other countries. So there's a comparative advantage that Australia and New Zealand um, have as to how that's used is a different matter and it also doesn't necessarily um, preclude uh, investment by non-common law countries in the area of particularly infrastructure uh, and or in substantive laws which don't necessarily have a, a common law um, uh, feeling about them. Mm. Any other questions? Uh, Kirk Huffman, I'm the honorary curator of the Vanuatu Cultural Centre in Vanuatu and I'm on the board of the Museum of Tahiti and the Islands in Tahiti and a few other places. Uh, thank you very, very much for some really well-balanced views there. Can I just throw in a sort of a question, sort of spin things around a bit? As a question, but also as a statement. Now, development, of course, is something that, from the Pacific Island viewpoint, is very different from what white men think. White men think that this is development where, from the point of view of particularly Melanesians, a lot of things that white people call development is exactly the opposite. Huh? Uh, and now you've mentioned the importance of, say, opening the economies to investors. Out in Vanuatu, the word investors is a, is a bad word. You, you say you're an investor and people will avoid you in the kava drinking nakama in the evenings. Eh? Because there's, they've been, near Vanuatu, been stung many, many times by people calling themselves okay. investors who turned out to be carpetbaggers or ripoff artists. Eh? Uh, an awful lot of this is to do with this incredible land alienation sort of pillage that's going on at the moment. Now, a lot of the, from the white man's economic point of view, Vanuatu and, say, the Solomons have done reasonably well in these instances because in Vanuatu, da-da-da, tourism and other things, but a lot of it is to do with land sales in Vanuatu, which essentially are very shonky, and may, many of them may actually be illegal, and it's creating incredible social tensions. You take away Melanesians' land, control over their traditional lands, and they'll fight. And this is something that all investors, all aid organizations, everyone has to be aware of. For Melanesians in the Western Pacific, the most important thing in life is their attachment to their land. If any form of development takes them away from that, there will be trouble in the pipeline. You cannot take Melanesians away from their land. Uh, all these big projects in Papua New Guinea, like you were saying. You know. If those take away Melanesians from their land, you'll get problems for generations and generations and generations. So, Kurt, you're, you're basically asking how, how to reconcile the different uh, yardsticks of right. development. Is, is there a way that big organizations in the white man's world could set up vetting organizations to find out if these so-called investors are actually honest or dishonest people? <laughs> now, what seems to be happening in many instances in Vanuatu is that many of these so-called investors are just rip-off artists. How can one stop that? And yet, unfortunately, they're upheld by the law. Maybe that suggests That's, legal reform. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, the formal level. But, uh, yeah, yeah. And the thing is, economic development, blah, 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 in the Solomons very often is based on illegal logging schemes. Yeah. Non-sustainable. It's like it, it, it's similar to the um, Millennium Development Goals. It's sort of how we, what yardsticks we use, and whose measure are they? And I suppose when you talk about these individual projects that like Caleb is, is talking about, you do get a sense, a one-on-one -on -one sense. But so, what is is there a problem with how we measure things versus how we invest? Yeah. Oh. To, to to help with that, can I just read you a little bit of a message I got from yesterday from 
a Melanesian, very high-ranking Melanesian colleague Briefly. in Moresby. <laughs> the rich and powerful are buying out the poor. He's talking about PNG here. What is the use of the United Nations Mel Mel Millennium Development Goal 1, extreme poverty alleviation? PNG is being bought out. The current government is hell-bent on facilitating the rich to take over PNG. This is a really high-ranking, smart, Melanesian, highly educated individual. Who would like to respond first? <laughs> then, okay. Okay. I mean, I think a, a, a starting principle for, for, for the world of development should be do no harm at, at the very minimum. But unfortunately, you're absolutely right. There are examples where uh, development has actually perhaps not worked and, and taken a situation backwards. Um, interestingly enough, there's a, there's a World Bank project uh, uh, funded partly through AusAid um, called Justice for the Poor, which is, in a sense, uh, 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 it's a research project which is, which is designed to, to look at um, ways of uh, lessening conflict and disputes where development has entered. So, and, and land is, can, is a very important part of that. And I know the project is working in the Solomon Islands and in PNG and in Vanuatu. So there might be some outcomes in that area. But interestingly enough, also from the point of view of, uh, of land, there, there was a time 10 years ago or so when, uh, when donors would say, don't mention the land. It was uh, an area that no one wanted to, to enter into. In the Solomon Islands, of course, the causes of conflict were within, intra the Solomon Islands, between two different groups. I'm simplifying it. Uh, uh, it wasn't necessarily outsiders coming in who, who impacted on the, the causes of, uh, of conflict. Uh, so anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> Rob, would you like to Look, uh, a couple of comments. I mean, first, I, I think up front, you know, some, some of the traditional structures in, in the Pacific and the traditional cultural structures are, are obviously very important. They, they go to the heart of the way people see themselves and they're, they're extremely important in providing, um, you know, a safety net for people. And I think we, we all recognise that. I think the second point though is on the whole integration between the Pacific Islands and, and the global economy has been beneficial. You know, we've, we, we've seen life expectancy increase, we've seen health services increase, we have less kids dying. Um, now I think the, the challenge is, is to try and make sure you know, that, that change is managed and that change is managed in a way that, that produces the greatest benefit for the islands and the islanders, rather than trying to, to stop change. You know, I, I, I think it's a little like King Canute, you know, that if, if, if that's the approach. So I think we are doing things to try and make sure that, you know, governments have capacity um, to regulate investment, governments have capacity to, to sensibly make sure they they get the the better investors and not some of the shonky carpet baggers um, around. And I think that, that that that's something we 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 all agree with. But I think that the key is to try and make sure we we bring the best of the traditional systems and 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 modern systems and, and, and try and make sure that, that, that change is managed in, in a way that brings the most benefits for, for the Pacific. Are there any other questions? Well, this is probably a question for the, um, for the whole panel, but there's been talk of uh, investment in private sector, in entrepreneurship, um, and uh, Daniel mentioned the uh, do no harm principle, but I was wondering, and also uh, Kaylee, you mentioned that NGOs, sorry, yeah, I mentioned the NGOs had a bigger role to um, to play. I'm just wondering what you think that role might might be. Is it that the previous programming has been um, not beneficial, or has it been kind of in the way of economic growth? Well, can I just um, respond initially to that? Um, if you look at um, you know the the number of healthcare clinics that are in operation in Papua New Guinea back in the 80s, I think there was about two and a half thousand. Uh, healthcare clinics operating throughout the country. 
Today, unfortunately, it's in the vicinity of about 600. And out of that 600, I'd say a very high percentage of those aid clinics actually run by the churches. And, you know, uh, putting religion aside, you know, when you look at the role the churches uh, play across the whole Pacific, um, you know, they have proven that they can effectively run, um, you know, and deliver services that traditionally would have been delivered by, you know, national governments and state governments or provincial governments as well. So, um, you know, there, there's great opportunity to involve um, other organisations, um, you know, in this mix as well, and they shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, if you look at uh, the recent report on the delivery of aid to Papua New Guinea, um, Stephen Howes and his team, you know, really emphasised the importance of involving NGOs, civil societies and the private sector in terms of providing a solution to some of the challenges that, that, that currently exist. Make a quick comment on a, on a very small catalytic uh, uh, example in, in Port Moresby, actually. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's been going for about seven, eight years. It's called You, Me, Look Out in Moresby. You and me look out for Mors Port Moresby, which, which is one of the more dangerous cities in the world, according to a, a UN uh, study. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a, a collaboration between local private sector, um, the national capital um, of Moresby, um, I think it's the National Capital Development Corporation, and um, and and what it does really, it started in in the, a couple of local markets. It it it, it, it seeks to reintegrate um, unemployed, disgruntled youth. I'm, I'm short, sort of changing it a bit, but uh, through almost like internships with uh, with with uh, local employers and. It's, it's had a very interesting catalytic effect in terms of um, that reintegration process in an urban setting uh, at a community level. Um, and there have been some quite uh, positive outcomes that, uh, that are now spreading beyond uh, the couple of areas where it started. I, it, you might be interested in following that up. We've just got time for one last question, just at the front here. Uh, the panel uh, has raised uh, questions of uh, the difference between the informal and the uh, formal sectors. I was just wondering if you could comment on the, I mean, the growing in inequality actually between the cities, the urbanisation and the globalisation, which is actually causing the incomes to rise in those cities, but the rural poor are being left behind. I was just wondering what policies or suggestions you may have for try maybe to get a regional policy whereby the cities support the, um, the rural areas more uh, sustainably? Look, I think this is an issue. Um, I don't think we should be addressing the issue by trying to stop income growth in, in the cities. I think one of the, the things we in the bank have learnt is, is that sort of migration, whether it be... but within the islands or, or, or from the islands to Australia or New Zealand or, or elsewhere, to the sources of growth is, is a good thing. Um, so I think that should be encouraged. But I, I absolutely agree. At the same time, there, there needs to be an effort to, to make sure that, that service delivery um, in education, in health, for the outlying rural areas is, is strengthened. Uh, we're working in a range of areas, community development in the Solomons, health and education in, in Tonga and Samoa, um, to, to, to do exactly that. Would you like to add anything? Um, yeah, just briefly, that, um, you, you know, I think the thing that strikes me uh, about your comment, and, and it's a, um, is, is the generalisation just around um, always putting the Pacific region in the same in the same sentence, and, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, we actually all do it, but, um, you know, I work for the Forum Secretariat, Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, um, and we represent 14 Pacific Island countries, and they are so unique and diverse that uh, I think, you know, the takeaway for, for us, uh, for, for me anyway, is that we really have to look at each individual country and what their needs are, um, and, and then determine what their needs are and service those needs accordingly. Um, when we look at 
uh, you know, urban versus rural areas. Um, again, you know, such a high percentage of the population lives in rural areas, um, and that's why ongoing uh, development in areas such as tourism and creative arts and agriculture and those sectors that actually do reach into the isolated communities I think is imperative as well. Um, you know, the mining, the mining of hydrocarbons that happens is, is often very isolated and, you know, as we look forward and look into to the future and have a vision, you know, we should develop strategies which actually serves the needs of the people uh, across both sectors and particularly in, in rural areas as well. I'd like to thank you for joining us today and thank you to our panellists, uh, Daniel Rowland, Caleb Jarvis and Rob Jauncey. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see you in a month's time for the next Praxis. If you'd like to subscribe to the podcast uh, or watch episodes online, go to worldbank.org forward slash Praxis. <laughs>